All right, good afternoon, everyone. I apologize for the delay. We were having some technical difficulties, which made it so that we didn't get started on time. Well, while I was talking to Dana in the office, because we weren't talking to all of you, very sorry about that, we were making a list of things that animals need to survive. Now, don't forget, during our online programming, you can participate. You can check our, or you can text into our live line at 562 286-1838. You can ask us questions. So Luke is over at the computer helping to grab the questions. We can answer some of them in the studio and Dana's going to help control some of the screen behind me. We're looking at Shark Lagoon. Let's go back to Shark Lagoon and like I said, we're making a list of things that animals need to survive. So what we started before was that they have to eat. They, if they eat, they have to go to the bathroom. And if they're going to the bathroom, something's going to have to take care of that. So we'll talk about the organisms that take care of that. And if they're in the ocean, they're going to need to get oxygen too. So they have to breathe. They need a home or a space besides just the entire habitat that is where they live. And they're going to need sunlight or a light of some kind. So let's take a look at Shark Lagoon real quick. And let's start talking about the difficulties of building this kind of space. What kind of challenges would we as people have to create a habitat like this one. Oh, beautiful sharks. So we have big animals, like you can see. We have some of the smaller fish in and around the coral. We even have a sea turtle in here. So one of the challenges we have is to put the animals together that should live together, but also those that are happier living with each other. So we don't want to put animals together that won't be able to cohabitate, but we also want to put animals together that look and resemble that habitat in the ocean. So these are animal ambassadors. They help us learn and experience what this space would be like if we were out at a tropical reef where there's lots of sharks and other animals inside. So that's one of the things, is putting together the right list of animals. What do you think it takes to feed the animals in here? Will we just throw all the food inside the water and that's all we have to do? Well, no, not really. We might do that for some of the smaller animals, but for our big sharks, like our black tip reef shark coming around the back here, we have to target feed them. So not only do you have to make sure you're feeding the right animals, you have to make sure you're feeding the right kind of food. So that is something to also take into consideration whenever you're creating a large scale habitat like this. Well, what about the little spaces, the homes we said they have? What does this look like to you? If you said concrete and fiberglass, you're correct. You didn't say that? That's okay. This is a replica of coral. So we create coral that is not live, that the animals don't mind, and it looks just like their normal home. It's very colorful. It has all the right shapes and purposes, and it looks exactly like the species in the ocean. So we create this kind of space for them to be on. We have the sand or the uh, gravel that's in the bottom of the exhibit, too. And we'll talk about cleaning and how we have to clean up after the animals. So in the ocean, is there a bathroom section in the ocean? Not technically. They just go to the bathroom wherever they want to. But then there's things that help clean up after each other. So when you are an animal or organism that is consuming decaying materials called detritus. Detritus is just or organic material of any kind that's just laying around decaying like dead leaves. It could be things that are animals that have passed away. It could be the waste of animals too. So those detritivores, the things that eat detritus, would be consuming all the leftovers and the waste in here. And uh, Luke said there's a lot of questions. We must have some school groups watching. He's so excited to answer your questions. We'll try and bring a few of them into the studio while in the time we have allotted so that uh, we can try and uh, teach the program we need, but also answer some of your questions for you on the air. Uh, so those things that would be eating all the decaying stuff... We can't put them all in here because we can't ensure that they're all eating what they're supposed to. But we can do that job ourselves. So one of the things that we have to do as a staff is keep our habitat clean. So we use these. Now what is this? It's a very good question. This we call a filter bag or a filter sock. And what this is is a way to trap any solid material in the filtration system. So let's take a look at a picture of some filtration behind the scenes, and let's see if we can find all the different parts that keep the exhibit running. Now, this is called a mechanical filter. Not because it's a machine or does any machining things. It's just a literal layer that prevents stuff from going through it. So here's a really big 
uh, filter bag right here, and we just put it on this pipe that comes straight from the exhibit into this space called the sump. So this big box of water is the sump. That's the spare salt water for this exhibit space. And what happens is that we can use this water to go through the rest of the filtration, which we'll talk about shortly. But this filter bag is the first phase of filtration. Any leftover food, any chunks of waste, anything that's floating around in the water gets trapped by this first as it goes into the sump. Now, where does it go next? It doesn't just go right back into the exhibit space. There's a lot of plumbing left to take a look at. So while Dana helps pull that picture up, let's keep thinking about those challenges we said. The animals have to eat and go to the bathroom, and we've kind of covered the both of those for the most part. We'll get back into it. But the oxygen. So while there's oxygen that can naturally diffuse into the water, it doesn't really get in there the best that we want it to. Temperature of the water can affect how much oxygen is absorbed, but also the amount of space at the top of the exhibit. If you've ever had a home fish tank, you might have had like a fish bowl or like a square or rectangular shaped fish tank. Well, the size of the surface area, just the top layer of the water, that's the only interface, the barrier between the exhibit and the water that we have that the oxygen can absorb into. Now, I think Dana has our picture ready. Uh, any of the exhibits that show behind the scenes filtration? She's asking which one, because we have a few pictures we're going to show you. So she's going to surprise me, and we'll just figure out where's what in that picture. So here's another look at the sump and the filter bag. Okay, do you recognize anything else? There's another one over here. All right, so oxygen in a space, in an exhibit. So this white wall behind us, that's actually the exhibit space. Now that surface layer, that interface, if it's very small, like in our blue cavern habitat, is our second largest exhibit in the entire building. It's 142,000 gallons approximately. There's not a lot of surface area at the top to get oxygen. So at night, we do something that you probably have seen or done in your own fish tank at home. If you need to add oxygen to a fish tank at home, what would you do? You might add a bubbler or an air stone. Blue Cavern has a giant bubble system that will help add oxygen to the water. Well, some of the filtration will do that too. Anytime you're churning up the water, you see it bubbling, you're adding oxygen to your water. Well, there's a couple of phases where that will happen. As the water cascades where Dana was pointing from this pipe into the filter bag, there's some foaming action, so we get some oxygen there. Now, in this tall middle tower, this is the next phase that we're going to talk about. This is actually a filter. It looks kind of weird, but this is a filter. And what it's holding are, I'm going to grab a couple examples. I mean, we can look at them a little uh, closer. It's holding these things. These are little filters. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure it's a little filter. Let's take a look at them under the camera real quick. Now, they look like they could be just kind of stackable objects. And technically, you can. You can stack them on top of each other. That's not really the purpose. All these little, what almost look like teeth or tines that are branches that are on them, what those are, are surface area. It adds the amount of space that we can grow bacteria. So here's my hand in comparison to this particular biological filter. So what that means is that this filter is going to have living stuff on it. Well, if it's that small, what's going to live on this? It's going to be even smaller. Bacteria. So there's good bacteria. There's bad bacteria. But there's a lot of good bacteria. Most of the bacteria in our bodies is good bacteria. There's only a little bit of the bad bacteria. That means it's the bacteria that would make you sick. So the bacteria that's on this, well, it could make us sick. What its job is, is to help filter the water. But what is it doing? It's doing something called the nitrogen cycle. So there's a lot of things in our world that they're used at different points and they have to cycle. They have to be in use in different phases and come back around to the same point. So what this is going to do is going to help filter out some of the nitrogen from the water or help change it. It's not really like absorbing it and taking it away. What it is, is the bacteria are changing nitrites to nitrates. Now, don't worry if you don't remember what those words mean. But what it is, is you're taking one form of the nitrogen, the nitrite, and making it a little less toxic than nitrate. 
So if you've ever had a home aquarium, you could test for the nitrogen levels. You can test for ammonia, you can test for nitrites and nitrates. And if they're in too high a level, it's not healthy for them. So we don't really absorb it out here. There's another filter that can. Now in your home aquariums, you might have seen something called a carbon filter. It is just carbon, black carbon that can absorb lots of different chemicals. So that is where the things might be absorbed out of the system completely. But here is where we change the nitrogen to a different form of nitrogen that is less toxic. All right, so that is our biological filter. Now that tower we saw has, is full of those. They're just floating around in there, holding bacteria. And as the water cascades through it, it helps the bacteria get that nitrite and change it into nitrates. Okay. Let's go to another picture behind the scenes and let's take a look at some more of the things that we have to do to help make sure the habitat stays clean. If you've ever had a fish bowl before, it's pretty easy to take care of the fish bowl and the fish in the bowl. You can put them in a smaller container, get rid of your water, clean it out, put the fish back in with some more new water. Well, we can do the same thing on a much larger scale, but in order to make sure we're not changing out that much water too often, we have to clean it with more filters. So here's the same space. There's that bio tower with the little biological filters in there. And then there's all of this stuff on the bottom here. This is an interesting kind of filter. This big round pill looking thing is called a sand filter. Well, how does sand filter anything? Ah, if you had any earth science, you might have talked about an aquifer. An aquifer is a layer of water underground that what happens is as the rainwater goes through the ground, the particulates, little things that are sitting in there, are filtered out as the rainwater continues to go down to the lowest level that water can penetrate. So now you have an aquifer. And aquifers generally are pretty clean. Not always. There's some chemicals and other materials that can get through too with the water, but not the large particles. Do we have another filter that we already talked about that takes out particles or large pieces of stuff? Yes, we had our, our, our filter bag. So this takes out the big stuff. The sand filter will help take out the little stuff. Now the sand filter will almost take out microscopic material. Not quite, but what we're doing instead of just letting it naturally settle through is we'll force the water through here under pressure. So there's also a little pressure gauge right there on our sand filter. And you have to have it set at a specific pressure. So it forces the water through the sand, which continues to filter more particulates or more solid media or materials out of the water. Okay. Then we might just be left with the most, or not the most, but the smallest amount of stuff, the microscopic materials. Now there's one more thing I want to show you on this picture before we change. We have this right here. How are we making all of this work? These are the water pumps. So an air pump pumps air like our bubbler would do. A water pump does not want to pump air. In fact, if, you're, if you get too much air in these pumps, they become what's called air locked. Then we've got to take things apart, put water in spaces to make sure that there's no bubbles that prevent the water from moving through the pump. Air locking is not, not a good thing. So you want to make sure the pumps always have the right a level of water in them. And that like if the water level gets too low, you get too much air sucked in, it's not going to be good for your pumps. But these are the pumps that force the water through the system. Okay, we had a couple questions come in. Uh, how do you know which animals can live together? And is there a filtration dance? We'll see about the filtration dance. But there are things that we know about animals and how they might live together. So we don't want to put a tropical warm water animal with a cold water temperate or like arctic animal. They don't have the same temperature range that they're going to live together in. So that's the first step is we try to replicate or use animals that would actually live in that one habitat we want to create. So in our, our shark lagoon habitat, which is a tropical space, we aren't going to put California species or even really northern Pacific species in there because the water is too warm and they're not really going to be very healthy in that water. So that's phase one of that. Well, the next phase would be picking animals that you know are not going to be what well, we might say aggressive or irritated by each other being in the same space. So really territorial animals, you can't have very many of them. In our blue cavern habitat, we have a few Garibaldi, which are pretty territorial, 
But we're not going to stock it with a lot of Garibaldi because if they're too territorial, they're not going to be nice to each other in a way that is really safe for every animal in there. So we pick animals that we know have the right temperament or the right behaviors that can mix together. So we might also do things that mm, combine different jobs of animals. So let's say we have Shark Lagoon. Actually, let's take a look at Shark Lagoon again if we can. Shark Lagoon has a combination of different animal roles. So that's another thing we have to be concerned with. It's not just, okay, these animals are friendly enough with each other. We'll put them together in the exhibit. We're good. We have to worry about making sure we're mixing some roles together. So the sharks, there's some behind me. They're going to come out on the screen. The sharks, ooh, and there's a stingray tail sticking up. <laughs> just a little thing waving around in the air. There's a shark, and there's a shark. So they are the large carnivores. They're the consumers. So ideally, we would also have smaller animals, like some of the fish, not that one particularly, but some of the smaller fish will feed on a little bit of the algae that grows on our model coral. So they are eating some of the algae. We don't have to worry about feeding them as much as if we don't have something in there for them to eat the algae off of. And I'm sorry, I'm just so entertained by this little the tail keeps sticking up from our, our reticulated whiptail ray. I wish she'd be visible. Oh, there she goes, right there. She likes to hang out at the bottom of the window where the camera is actually at. So we, we've now mixed a consumer with an animal that is also a consumer. It eats stuff, but it is lower on the food chain level, meaning it is a primary consumer where it's eating like plant-like material. It's not really eating animals. Or you can add omnivores, which are in the next phase or the next level of who's eating what. So they eat a little bit of the animal products. They eat some of the plant products. And you can mix them together to cry and create an exhibit that is healthy enough on its own that we don't have to do as many of the jobs ourselves as the animals would be doing. Like our Northern Pacific Touch Lab we call Coastal Corner, that has some of the little crabs in there and the snails. So the crabs and the snails will clean up after the rest of the animals. The sea stars, well, they'll eat almost anything. So we're not too worried about making sure that they eat what they're supposed to. And then the anemones are going to catch any food that would fly by, but we specifically feed each star an anemone in here and every fish, but the little animals that are the detritivores, see like here's a greenling, the detritivores will clean up after everybody else. We're not as worried about trying to make sure that they get as much food directly handed to them, but we know if we mix all these roles together, we can have a healthy habitat. So that's a great question about how do we know which animals can live together? All right, um, what types of innovations are there for filtration? Well, here's one of my favorite parts of filtration. If we can pull up our uh, video of the protein skimmer, this is something that has been pretty interesting. Now, if you look at saltwater aquaria hobbies, it hasn't been around forever. It's really been most popular for the last maybe 50 years. And scientists and hobbyists and people at home were creating things on their own. They didn't have all the technology that we have now. So a protein skimmer wasn't always a thing. And you know what this does, this is actually a simple innovation, but serves a great purpose. The bubbling action you see down here, what it's doing is collecting all of that dissolved material. So anything that is not a large particle of something, it's not the nitrogen that we already talked about getting filtered out, this will help take out more chemicals that attach to the bubbles, and then it percolates and bubbles up over into this compartment right here. And from there, it can drain down to this tube. But what this helps to do is to take out any fats or proteins that still have not been filtered out. Well, where do those fats and proteins come from? From the food, potentially just material that has dissolved into the water as we put food in the water, but also the waste. When the animals go to the bathroom, that's where some of that goes. And to help keep that out of the water because it keeps the exhibit healthy, we have the protein skimmer. It's also called, an, uh, I believe it's an oxygen fractionation tower. It's Foam fractionator, it's adding oxygen. So the foaming action, remember we talked about if there's a little bit of foaming action, there's oxygen getting in the water. This will help add more oxygen to your exhibit space. Now, home hobbyists for their own saltwater aquariums created this idea. They created a lot of the different filtration pieces that we now use and think of as just the staple of a home aquarium. But we had to figure this out. And so that's an innovation that really does help these spaces. Now, the future of how aquariums are run in terms of like our space, this can change based on the technology that we have or even the needs of the animals that are in those spaces. One of the really interesting things that we also do here is we make our own ozone. 
I believe that's still true. We do have an ozone filtration device, and only our biggest exhibits will use that. How does ozone work? Good question. Ozone is three oxygen molecules, or three oxygen atoms to make one molecule, versus the two that make the oxygen that we breathe. Ozone is also very uh, caustic. It breaks things down. It's very good at killing living materials. So you don't want to actually breathe a lot of ozone. But what we can do is we can introduce that ozone to some of the water, not the water where the animals are at, water that's going through the plumbing, and it will help kill a lot of the bacteria. So if we didn't have the technology to create ozone, we couldn't filter our exhibits in that way. Even using something like a UV light to shine at a clear tube of water, remember we're not just putting UV light or ozone onto the animals, that's not really gonna help. But if the water is in part of the plumbing system and as it passes through this tube, these machines can add this type of filtration to clean the water, to get rid of bacteria, to get rid of viruses, any other living materials that we don't want in the water that nothing else in the, all the other filter, filters we've seen could filter out, that helps with that. Here's our UV light. Now, one of the interesting things is, we, we don't have a picture of it. I'm not even sure there's one that exists in the building, a picture of our control room. So the life support system is centrally controlled. So the UV light being available, the speed of the pumps, the water level, the temperatures. So there's a lot of digital technology that's been put into Aquaria also. And we have a control room, our own little control space where they know what's going on at all times. If an Aquarist, a person that's taking care of the exhibit, did a water change and the water level went too low, or if the thermometers randomly were reading a temperature spike, maybe the heater or the cooler had been turned off on an exhibit, there's alarms that go off in our control room. <clears throat> and the life support staff would contact the Aquarist to make sure is that supposed to be happening? What's going on? So we also have a lot of digital help going on with helping all of these different spaces be able to run as smoothly as they do. Now, Dan is bringing this up. Here is, I'll stand on the other side. Here is some of the control center electronics. So these are the flow rate meters, but also the temperature gauge. And your home aquarium might filter its own volume maybe once to five or six times per hour, maybe 10 times per hour if it's a really powerful pump. Ours might do a hundred times or hundreds of times the equivalent of the water per hour, depending on how big the exhibit is. Our biggest exhibit, it's probably not gonna do 350,000 gallons 50 times an hour, but it still has a lot of filters tied to it. So our systems also filter much faster because in an exhibit, it has to be as clean as possible, not only for you to see the animals, but for the animals, <clears throat> excuse me, for the animals to be really healthy too. All right, uh, another question, how does the ocean naturally perform the filtration process that we do? So we talked about some of the organisms that take care of that. Well, the other thing is the ocean has a lot of surface area. So there's a lot of oxygen that can dissolve through the top of it. But the animals that are living really deep, they're adapted to probably a different level of oxygen. But the other thing to think of is that as you go deeper in the ocean, it gets colder. Colder water can store more oxygen than warm water can. So what we're thinking of is these very large systems. So think of deep water currents that will fluctuate nutrients and materials up and down enti the entire water column, hundreds or thousands, if not the full expanse of the depth of the ocean. And then there's also surface currents and winds and storms that will generate a lot of activity at the top. So the ocean is pretty well designed to take care of itself. The animals help clean up after each other. Uh, anything that passes away in the ocean, let's say there was a large animal that had died in the ocean. Well, there's a lot of things that are going to feed on it, not only at the surface when it is bloated and it's kind of sitting up there, but when it sinks too, there's a lot of creatures that will clean up after the decaying material. There's also the idea of the materials being dissolved across a large space. It's very diluted. If we have a small exhibit space, those waste materials can build up really quickly. So we have to trade out the water. Well, in the ocean, there's a lot of ocean, so they dilute into very low particulate amounts or low densities that we don't have to worry as much about trying to filter it out on its own. The ocean will take care of itself. So like an algal bloom that happens, there's a lot of algae that grows and takes up all the nutrients and oxygen, all the algae will pass away, and then things will clean up after it, and it will rebalance itself after a little while. So the ocean does have a lot of different things that are going in to help keep it running correctly. 
We just try to copy all of that in a closed space with all those pumps and filters and machines and digital technology and people. We're reproducing all of that from ins inspiration of what the ocean is actually doing. Uh, all right. I think we got all of our stuff there. There was one more question about filtration between a cold water habitat and a warm water habitat. Pretty much it works the same. You don't have to worry about different kinds of materials. You do have to worry about bigger or smaller filters based off of the type of exhibit and what is in there. So some of our exhibits that have filter feeders, they're eating the plankton that should normally be in that area. The filters have to allow the plankton to be in there or we have to reintroduce more and more plankton to be in that space. And they also have to try and filter out more smaller stuff. So the plankton that does not get eaten, we don't want it sitting in the exhibit and decaying and making it more toxic for the thing to be in there. So depending on what the animals that live in that space are, will determine more about your filters. The size of the space determines more about your filters than the temperature of the water. Not in every case, but in a lot of cases. All right, well, I think we've covered everything about filtration and how we have to run a space like the Aquarium of the Pacific behind the scenes. Now there's one more program this afternoon that we're gonna talk about kelp forest conservation. So tune in to learn more about the kelp forest habitat, which is what we have locally here in Southern California. And thank you for everybody watching and tuning in and asking questions, we really appreciate that. So please stay tuned for more material at our two o'clock program. Have a good rest of your Thursday afternoon, everybody.